Marina Furman has been working tirelessly as Director of Development for the Jewish National Fund on behalf of the State of Israel. All of this since her time released from the Soviet Union. Providence brought her to the United States 15 years ago, and from her headquarters in Philadelphia, she has the pulse on what is going on in the world of Jewry in the United States. Not only during that time has she got grown fond of Moor, but she has also joined us as a teacher and as a trip leader, and recently taking 30 Moor students last year back to Moscow and St. Petersburg. She is no doubt a hero, and she is no doubt a visionary, and it is an absolute pleasure to call on Marina Furman to join us this evening. Dobry vecher. Tom forgot to mention that the rest of my presentation would be in Russian. <laughs> Didn't we all come from there one time or the other? Um, it's really enormous honor for me to speak here tonight. You know, I remember being the age of students here today, and actually some teachers too, and thinking what my future might be, or rather whether I have one. And in my wildest dreams, I could not imagine just how incredible and bright that future can be and will be. When I was 26 years old, I was married for six months, and for the first time in my life, I celebrated Hanukkah. We put our little Hanukkiah on the window, looking down, seeing the KGB car, watching, knowing what to come. I didn't celebrate Hanukkah ever before, not because I didn't want to, I didn't know it existed. Jews in Soviet Union had no faith, no voice, no name, no religion. The only thing we had was fear. And few of us, few hundred refuseniks, stood up against the government that ruled with fear. I didn't know Hebrew. I didn't know Brachot. I just repeated after my husband, and the one word that stuck with me in that Hanukkah blessing was word Ness, miracle. And I sure hoped that that miracle will happen for me. I was four months pregnant with my first child, and I was told by the KGB that because of what we did and who we were, they will try, they will not try. They will kill me when I will give birth to my child. Because my husband in Leningrad worked for Maor. Not literally. Maor didn't exist then. We didn't know about Maor. But he did the same thing. People came all over the city to his apartment, knowing very well they might be arrested. They sat, they ate, they drank, and they learned. And they discovered God and Judaism and Israel and who they really were. And that was a crime in the Soviet Union because this dictatorship, this empire, so cruel, so relentless, was afraid of that ore, of what that knowledge 
of that their passion could do to them. And then they were right. Because you know what? All of you and all of us, we brought them down. I was wondering then, lighting my Hanukkah candles, if I will love, live long enough to complete the circle to celebrate all the Jewish holidays. Because I never did before meeting and marrying my husband. I celebrated Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Sukkot, but Hanukkah was different. It was about war, and it was about hope, and it was about miracle. We told our story to people around the world, and they encouraged us to continue, not to give up, and they created this little symbol, this bracelet, that thousands and thousands of you were, and one of them had my name, and thousands of people thought that it was unacceptable to do what KGB was planning to do to me. My life mattered. It was just one life. And when I learned about the attempt and the fight and the struggle of American Jews and Jews around the world on my behalf, I couldn't understand why. It was just one life and life of unborn baby. In Soviet Union, individuals and their lives didn't matter. And what, that was the biggest thing I discovered, that when you are Jewish, when you're part of the Amcha, each life, it's Jewish war matters a lot. Among people protesting and fighting and lobbying on our behalf were a group of people far away in Great Britain. There was a little girl whose name was Rufi, who was too little to understand what she was doing, but she protested too. Rufi Lynn, she wasn't Lynn then, with uh, my name, um, with the poster. And just happened so, her mother was a one of the very, very uh, big activists in the Soviet Jewry movement in England. And only God would have it that when they came to America, Rabbi Lean and Rufi Lean settled around the block, five minute walking distance from us and we discovered each other. And for the first year, I would come over to Lynn's house and I tried to have an intelligent conversation with Rabbi Lynn and with Rufi. And it was never possible because there were always people sleeping on their couches, on the floor, eating in their kitchen, talking to them, discussing halachic issue or problems with their marriage or anything else, and they kept having children, and the more children they had, the more people slept on their couches, and the more people they slept, uh, came to their dinner table. And I thought, my God, these people are crazy. <laughs> you know why I understood? Because everyone who comes to the table and listens to that conversation and watches that beautiful family matters. Each person who will discover Judaism, who will discover the beauty of what it can be, matters to all of us. And you have to be crazy to work for more work because it's not a job. It's a mission. It's around the clock. It never stops. But what these people achieve is absolutely remarkable. And I was so lucky that one time Rabbi Lin asked me to speak for more. 
And I don't know if it did anything for the students, but it definitely changed my life. And then a few years later, we all ended up in St. Petersburg with 26 students. It was a trip of 10 days and no nights. We never slept. We talked and discussed and complained. And we discovered such depths about each other and who we are as individuals and as people. And Bobby, I don't know where you're sitting, and I don't know if you remember that, but you said to me on the bus in St. Petersburg, everyone educates us. No one inspires us. Maor inspires us. It's a tough job to inspire kids today. They're busy, they're cynical, there's too much going on, but they get inspired every single day by these incredible people. And when we ended up on the palace square where we once were arrested, and when my, ninth, when my nine month old baby was put alone in a prison cell, Jack, who will be honored tonight, started dancing and singing and Robert Lynn joined in. And before we knew it, ladies and gentlemen, we were dancing horror on the birthplace of Soviet revolution for Maor. And there was a lot of light there. Policemen looked at us, but they didn't come close, and they let us finish our joyous and victorious dance. I have been on the blind date with God and Judaism for many years, because when I discovered and loved Judaism, I loved not because I knew it, but because I felt it. And I wish today that there was more for me too, that I would able to learn the way these kids learn through these incredible teachers. And I'm so happy to know, and I know, I don't hope, that when my kids have their families and their kids, there will be more for them too. My beautiful baby, who had no chance against brutal dictatorship, they attempted to kill her before she was ever born. This October will become a color. <laughs> and people will come, are coming from all over the world all those who march with our names of their posters, not only to celebrate a love of two people and beginning of Jewish family, but celebrate love of Jewish people for one another. Because that what makes us who we are, that what makes us chosen people, that what gives us not hope, but knowledge that when we discuss Jewish future, that sentence will never end with the question mark. But because of Maor, because incredible people like Rabbi Gershenfeld, like Tom Steinberg, like all of you who work and have but give, that Jewish future will never be subject for debate but for incredible pride. Thank you very much.